Hello and welcome to another submarine chat. I haven't done any submarine chats for quite a long time. There's a lot going on, obviously. I don't find as much time as I'd like. But let's give this a try. Um, if you're like me, you're probably a huge fan of the top five or the bottom five tanks that the Tank Museum uh, YouTube channel does. Brilliant. It's not going to be quite as cool as that. Obviously, we don't have a museum we can wander around. But I'm going to explore, at least in my opinion, some of the contenders for the worst submarines that have ever existed. A few ground rules. I'm not going to go after anything that's before World War One. I. I think that's unfair. At the earliest days of submarines, all submarines were, by modern standards, terrible. But at the time, you have to make some allowances for, for where people were technologically. Also, I'm not going to go after any submarines that were not actually built. So with that in mind, let's get on with it. First one in at number five. I'm going to go for the easy, the low-hanging fruit, the one that most people are expecting to be here. I was, I was considering not including this. I'm actually quite a fan of this submarine. But I do accept it's pretty bad in a lot of ways. And I think if I didn't include it, the comments would just be full of people talking about it. Um, yeah, it's pretty bad in a few ways. So this is the British K-class submarine. It was built in 1917, so during World War One. It was, at the time, the largest submarine in the world for a brief period. And it was designed as a high-speed cruiser submarine. So a new concept of submarine, very high surface speed, quite slow underwater, as was the nature of submarines at the time. Really interesting design. It had uh, lots of guns, as you can see, torpedo tubes, fire shooting forwards, torpedo tubes shooting at broadside at the side, and also swiveling torpedo tubes in the casing. Loads of weapons, really interesting. So what was so bad about it? Well, what people will normally point out is that it was steam powered. That was for surface speed. So on the surface, it had steam engines. To submerge, they had to fold the, the uh, funnels away and prevent water, make it watertight so water couldn't go into the engines while they're hot. That would have caused an explosion and sinking of submarine. So it wasn't the only steam-powered submarine, but in general, people consider steam-powered submarines to be inherently crazy. Um, and we're talking boilers and so on, not nuclear submarines. Of course, again, if you see people writing about nuclear submarines in the comments, you know how far they listened. The other characteristic of this particular submarine, like a lot of submarines at the time, it had a very shallow diving depth. In fact, the diving depth was less than the length of the submarine. I forget exactly what the stats were, but basically the submarine could have one end of it on the surface and the other end crushed. So that's very limited diving. But its biggest crime, the reason I'd include it in the top five is because it was a flawed concept of a submarine and they built 17 of these flawed submarines. Demonstrated by a catastrophe, um, Operation EC-1, it's a training exercise in 1918 near the Isle of May, is forever known as the Battle of the Isle of May. Three submarines, or well, two submarines were lost and four more were, were damaged. Three of them suffered deaths. Why were they lost? collisions the concept was to use submarines and warships in close proximity to each other and this is before effective underwater communication even today we do not do this we try to separate submarines and service ships there's all sorts of problems at the time at night the collisions and of course the submarines always lost and sunk and nearly 100 people died actually over 100 people died as a result of that as a result of a flawed uh, concept. So moving on, I'm going to keep the theme of large submarines because I mentioned that the K-class was the largest submarine in the world. It seems that every time someone builds a submarine that is the largest in the world, it can come in for its fair share of criticism. People are pushing the envelopes and people, uh, the engineers are pushing the envelopes, of course, and people can easily question their wisdom. For example, HMS X-1, 
comes in for a lot of criticism. Sir Kauf, French submarine, it's almost blasphemous, but as many people who love it also think it was a crazy design. I'm on the, uh, yeah, I think it was a very impressive design, if I'm honest. I-400, the largest submarine of World War II, Japanese, even the Typhoon class, which has something of a legendary status, can come in for a fair amount of criticism. But there is one that I think deserves more criticism than all of these. And that is the US Navy submarine, USS Triton. You're going to notice a common theme. I actually find it quite hard to say anything bad about any of these submarines. Again, like all of them, a really interesting design, really pushing some boundaries. But ultimately, objectively, not a very clever design. So this was an early first generation nuclear submarine built in the 50s. Its main feature was that it had two nuclear reactors. And in fact, you could say that it was built more than anything to test the idea of having more than one nuclear reactor. Was it possible? Yes, it was. And it was designed to be extremely fast on the surface as well as underwater. Now, it's a nuclear powered submarine, so it doesn't have to surface. You, you can see a hint of the problem already. I think its speed on surface was 30 knots, and I think submerged was probably about 30 knots as well. It's basically the same speed underwater as on surface, which is quite impressive. It was also extremely large. So here we have um, Triton in the background next to a, another US Navy nuclear powered attack submarine. You can see the size difference. These submarines are contemporary. Triton was massive. And why was it so big? Well, it was going to carry a radar. So radars, as you know, are suitable for operations above water. So we had submarines that carried radars. It's called a radar picket submarine. The idea was that it would be ahead of or on the flanks of the, the fleet and provide early warning of incoming bomber attacks. There was, it had a ginormous sail and within that sail there was a radar now this was entering service in 1959 that is significant about the same time there were other radar picket submarines it was a thing the u.s navy converted some older submarines and also commissioned some sailfish class submarines these were purpose-built radar picket submarines you can see a couple of radars there on the left. And the Soviets also had radar picket submarines, although these were all conversions. Um, and they had them a bit later, in 1964. So about the same time, but a bit a few years later. Now, the problem Triton was launched in 1959. Already in 1958, the first um high capability carrier born airborne early warning systems were entering service they'd already been experimenting with avengers and so on but the purpose-built uh grumman tracer was introduced in 1958 much more effective than radar picket submarines and by 1964 you have the hawkeye which of course is still versions of that still in service today so contemporary with the development of the hawkeye there is a radar picket submarine that's nuclear powered it's the biggest in the world it's as it happens, noise is anything that all nuclear submarines were at the time. It was obsolete in its role before before it even got in the water. And it basically hung around. It did an uh, impressive um, round the world tour, but in operational terms was obsolete, let's say, in its role very quickly and not very good at any other role. Bit of a bit of an elephant. Moving on, number three, the Soviets also had a lot of bad submarines and a lot of ugly ones and a lot of noisy ones. It's usually noise that um, you hear about and safety. I'm not going to go after the ones on the safety record. That is a much more nuanced topic than most people give it credit for. And of course, it's not only the Russians that had issues with submarine safety. You know, as I'm recording this, I think the news is probably still on the submarine missing in the Atlantic, the sub small submersible comes to home. But all the same, I'm going to I'm going to go after a Russian submarine here, the Soviet submarine. 
going to surprise a few people. I'm going to go after the Alpha class. If I was putting which of these designs was the most unforgivable, it's the Alpha class. Now, I'm a fan of the Alpha class from a design and engineering perspective. I don't have favorite submarines as such, but the Alpha class is undoubtedly one of the most interesting and, in a popular sense, one of the coolest submarines. It was extremely fast, 41 knots, for a long time thought to be the fastest submarine in the world. Wasn't second fastest, still much faster than Western submarines. It's designed as an interceptor submarine. Again, an unusual concept. The idea it is only launched from its base um, when a threat is detected and rushes and goes and intercepts the threat and kills the threat, obviously. It was highly automated. And to get its high speed, it used a titanium hull. But what I'm going to go after, the reason I think it's a terrible design is none of those things. It's because of its reactor. It used a liquid metal called reactor. That meant that it had to be on at all times because otherwise the metal would, would solidify and the reactor would be um, gone. It's basically a bad idea. The US Navy admittedly did experiment with similar uh, ideas for sure, um, but it's really bad. And again, if they just built one and it was experimental, I would have forgiven it, but they built these in numbers. It was for that reason a bad time. If they'd built the same submarine, but with a more conventional reactor, it would have been slightly larger. It probably would have been slower, but it would have been a much better submarine. Coming in for number two, you're going to be as surprised as I am. I can't remember what I put in number two. Oh, yes, I can. Change of tack. One way of thinking about the problem is to ask, well, what is the worst submarine that's in service today? The worst that's doing its job. This submarine on the screen, Lada class, is pretty bad, but I'm not going after that one. I'm going to go after another submarine that people who follow me and follow my my uh, my website in particular will be surprised that I'm going after the Fatah class. This is an indigenous submarine from Iran. It's small and simple. Although I say it's small, you it still count it as a full size submarine. Just it happens to be at the very smallest end of that spectrum. It's also the least capable objectively of any modern submarine um, that you sort of consider a normal size submarine, let's say. Interesting things about it. I, I think its weapons quite interesting. In particular, it carries a lightweight anti-ship missile, which is encapsulated in a, uh, a torpedo-like casing, which has its own motor and propellers to get it out so it can swim out of the torpedo tube. A really interesting idea allows for anti-ship missiles to be carried by much smaller submarines. That is good. But the rest of it, it is outdated. It's good from, you know, from the perspective of the first submarine designed and built or large submarine designed and built in Iran is terrible in every other respect. So coming into number one, what are the worst submarines ever built? Well, I'm going change theme again. Single person submarines, not wet submarines, but dry ones. Um, so the, there's a the submarine driver or pilot is on their own operating a submarine. They're not wearing diving gear or anything. Or they don't have to. In World War II, several countries built these. Germany built a series, including the Marder, shown here, um, top left, basically a torpedo with a person in the front and carrying another torpedo. The uh, Japanese made the Kaiten and others, and the British made the Wellman. So the Marder just didn't work. It was terrible. Partly it's the crew quality, but even with good crew, I don't think it'd be very good. The Kai-10 was much too fast to actually hit anything, I think is probably the, the cause. Impressive specifications, terrible at actually hitting its targets. And the Wellman you haven't heard of probably because it wasn't very good. It was so bad it was never actually used, although it's extensively developed and trained. But none of these are the worst. There's one that's even worse than all of them. And that is the, the Viber class. This was a German submarine, like the Marder and, and other lots of other German submarines laid in the war. It's something of a desperation. It had a single crew member. They were not elite. 
they were um almost young and inexperienced under trained under motivated and so on armed with two torpedoes i think it's only fair that i say something good about it i think from purely from design perspective it was interesting in a couple of ways firstly you can see that the hull is not not circular in cross section it has these indents those are actually pressure pressure resistant you can see that it's actually just a hull cut open and flipped around that allows the torpedoes to be carried on the outside semi recessed as it were i think very interesting clever design also you'll notice that it's got two bulkheads running around the submarine forward and aft of the the uh, sail which is like the cabin and that is uh, bolted bulkheads which allows it to be disassembled and reassembled very quickly for transportation on road so it's got some good features from a design perspective but it also has a terrible habit and that was that it frequently killed the crew fumes from the engine um, would get into the cabin and and basically suffocate the crew um, it was much more dangerous to the crew than the enemy a real desperation weapon miserable terrible design all single person submarines i'd say suffered ultimately even even if they'd been well designed mechanically it was too much for a single person to do it was never really realistic that a single person on their own could crew a submarine make it operate effectively hit a you know to make a effective search for the target do the the target acquisition and the uh the shoot the torpedoes accurately etc cetera, etc cetera. the successful small submarines were two or four person one person just never worked okay thank you very much um this is the worst submarine ever hopefully you found it interesting i'm still doing more serious analysis um i will look to put some of it on youtube at some point in the near future if i can find time um, but please bear with me and understand that there's a lot of other commitments I have to prioritize. Thank you very much.